I'm Rob Lucuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, here with Tom Eagles, who edited The Heart of Day Fall. I should say Oscar-nominated editor, Tom Eagles. Tom, um, first of all, uh, you know, congratulations on some really fantastic work in James Samuel's The Heart of Day Fall. I think the first question I want to talk to you about is the tone of the film, because, um, you know, you're renowned for working on films that have, you know, comedic touches, but are also quite heartfelt and dramatic. This film is definitely in the same boat, but... It's got a really fascinating tone. I'd love for you to talk us through how the edit was so important in striking the right balance um, in tonally for the film. Yeah, I mean, it does have a, a lot of balls in the air tonally. Um, you know, there's, there's comedy, there's action, there's, and there's really broad stylistic touches and all this amazing music. But then there's, um, you know, at the end of the day, quite a heartfelt, um, serious, earnest film in there. Uh, which we kind of work our way towards by the end of the movie. And so, um, you know, that ending was, was really important to us. We kind of had to work our way backwards from, from that and, and earn, uh, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but the, the big reveal at the, the end mm. um, and do that in a way that was uh, satisfying but not predictable for the audience, but made sense. Um, so it was always about keeping those, the, the axis between those two characters, Nat Love, Jonathan Majors, and Rufus Buck, as played by Idris Elba, and keeping that as a very kind of simple axis for the film. Um, and kind of keeping Nat's rage and, and, and pain and anger central, using some of the other characters to, to color things in, to shade things into humor, for example. So. Um, two characters that were very important to us were Jim Beckworth and, and Bill Pickett. Uh, and I think it's probably the third scene into the movie where we, we meet them. Um, and that was kind of important to us. It was it, that scene in a way strikes the tone for what the heart of they fall is because it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of action. Um, there's serious underpinnings, but, um, but those two, we kind of called them our C-3PO and R2-D2. They were kind of the soul of the movie. And in a way, making them so funny um, pays off later in the movie. I don't know how many spoilers we're going to do here. Yeah, but, you know uh, what? If you haven't seen the film, can you just stop this? Go stop Netflix now. And watch it. Go Come see back. the movie. Because we're going to spoil stuff. All right. And spoiling in three, two, one. Those guys are going to die. So um, <laughs> Exactly. So... Yeah to have set them up as these really fun, light characters, actually, I think really helps that later on. You don't really see that coming. And I think it's a lot worse for the audience when that does yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, and likewise for, you know, revealing, now that we're doing spoilers, revealing that the, the two leads are brothers, um, we wanted to, it was really important for us to get that balance right. You know, we had earlier cuts of the film that had, more information in there. Um, really? There were there was a flashback illustrating Rufus's childhood, and ah. it not only gave us too much narrative information, it just gave us too much insight into the man. We wanted to keep him as a mysterious, dangerous character right up until the end. But we did want to pepper in a few things to um, just little cherries, like uh, the ring becomes important between the two men. We we searched out every little piece of the ring we could find. We even went back and shot mm -hmm. pickups. Um, wow. The ring that Nat gives to Mary, which is the ring that his father gave to his mother, that Rufus then takes. Um, of and, you know, we postulated various backstories as to, does, you know, does Rufus know this ring? Likewise, um, I had the idea to put, um, there's a beautiful steady cam shot as uh, in the, the first scene where the two men meet as adults, the only other scene, aside from the final scene in the movie, um, there's a beautiful steady cam shot that's Rufus's point of view. And I had the thought to put a whistle over that and have him whistling the same tune that Nat sings to Mary. And it's maybe only on a second viewing that you might kind of pick up on, on that yeah. kind of stuff and wonder like, how do they, how do they know that same, same tune? So it was fun, yeah, you know, seeding all of those little cherries in there and hopefully tonally um that's all consistent and, and pays off in the end yeah see 
a lot of this obviously comes through the screenplay, the performances, James's eye as a director. But, and I'm not just saying this, I mean, I always say this to film editors, so much of this is done in the editing room because, as you say, you can show a bit too much leg, you can keep it un- hidden, you can reveal it later, and that will absolutely affect our the way that we enjoy the film, the way we viscerally feel those uh, payoff moments that have to feel earned, but also feel surprising. So talk us through the challenge of um, getting it right. How do you know you've got it right? Do you, is it just a collaboration and you just it's, have to settle? Like, well, how do you do it? You, um, yeah, it, it's tough to know. Um, you kind of have to follow your gut. You can test, and we did test. Oh, yeah. um, and the version of the, the film that we tested was was pretty much the same structurally as the one that you've seen. So we knew, and from sitting in that room with people, you literally hear people gasp and you hear people say things like, I wonder if that's the razor that he used to cut him. And, oh my God, that's, that's the, ra- oh my God. You know, so you just from sitting in the room without even reading the cards, you kind of, you do get a sense of whether those things are paying off in the right way. Yeah. Um but you've also got to take your own temperature and it helps. It does help even, even if you couldn't see or hear those other people, it, it helps me to view with some other people, even if it's a small audience, you know, 10, 12 people, because yeah. it takes you out of your intention and you, you do start to see it as an audience somewhat. I mean, that's a skill that all editors try and cultivate, I think, um, is like how, how to get out of having seen it a million times and a million versions and, and even, you know, knowledge that's not in the cut that you're presenting, that sometimes yeah. other people in the process might hang on to. That's so fascinating. You're using fresh eyes, so to speak. You've seen a, a particular sequence a thousand times in different permutations as you cut, take a second off here, throw a second on there. So that's interesting that you're able to do that. Brings me to this. This film's really interesting in the way that you edited it because I've seen obviously lots of other Westerns, lots of other action films uh, where there are two warring gangs and we're going back and forth between them and that's all very fantastic. But you did it differently. Can you talk us through what what you did and why you decided to go down that road? Right. I mean, um, we actually decided to hold off meeting the Rufus Buck gang in, in Toto until pretty much the second act or you know a good 20 minutes into the film um part of the reason we did that was we had so many characters you know it's a it's a big cast and you want to do them all justice um and again you know we we pulled out some material of rufus so that he became more mysterious so the first time that we really the first time we see his face it's got to be 30, 30, 35 minutes into the movie. Um, yeah. And yet he's been such a big presence because you've seen his back and, and parts of him in the opening scene. Um, but we did have some prison scenes of him that we pulled out. Um, we had also met in the original assemble, we'd met Trudy Smith, Regina King, yeah. Cherokee Bill, as played by Lakeith Stanfield, and we'd met Wiley Esco um, in this big kind of expository scene that that set up this whole debt storyline that was a little bit of a misdirect. Um, Mm. We found that it sort of led you down uh, the wrong path, really. You know, it was a very simple story between these two men. So we took that material out, but in doing so, we found that we got um, really great entrances for all of those characters. So the first time we meet Trudy, she's facing off a train. Cherokee has got this beautiful... Um, soliloquy on non-violence and then you know cuts a man up and, and Wiley has enters the film in this big piece of camera we speak into the camera so um, by actually pulling them out of the first 20 minutes we were able to take our time and give them each a scene of their own to introduce them as characters mm. and then through the middle of the film you know uh, in, in the longer fully assembled movie we were cutting constantly back and forth between the gangs, one scene for another, one scene for another. And um, it just, it sort of broke the spell. You wanted to sink into the world of, of each gang and live yeah. with them for a while. So, so that's what we did. And, and we started consolidating it and I wasn't quite sure. And I was watching 
the godfather 2 one night and i thought okay i'll watch the special features i'll see what walter merch has to say you know kind of editing godfather yeah. <laughs> and it just so happened that he was talking about um they did a very similar thing in that movie with the present day story the al pacino story and the de niro story in sicily yeah. back in the day they had the same problem that they were constantly flopping between the two um and so they settled into you know i think much more so in that movie they settled into quite big chapters but we kind of thought of it in that way as well it's sometimes useful to mentally if not physically break the film into into chapters i can't believe you just brought that up because i swear to god i was thinking about that as i was watching a, a little bit after i was watching the film about oh. how chapterish it feels and how the godfather part two for me is like so this is a masterpiece and it's in my top films of all time. And I love it how I'm with De Niro in the olden days for such a long time. And then I get snapped back into the present day without expecting it. And it just keeps me kind of engaged. You did the same thing. I love that. It also, the big entrances for some of those characters to me felt really epic. Um, I, I don't really know why. <laughs> But, but yeah, all that stuff is no, stuff that we lay people, we don't even notice it, but it actually, it goes in somehow, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, I think, you know, when you've, um, you give a character screen time and, um, yeah. and you give them uh, an entrance that is befitting that, that character. You know, we did the same thing with um, Pickett and Beckworth. We had a, a, a scene at the opening of that Canyon sequence where they were just talking together. We thought, wouldn't it be great to just open that sequence with um, Pickett singing to himself and, and picking these guys off with a rifle? Like, what kind of psychopath is this guy? Yeah. Uh, and then Jim Beckworth entering, um, you know, with his um, beautiful piece about patience, uh, you know, so he's revealed. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think you soak all of that stuff up. And it does feel epic yeah. because, in part because you're giving these people time mm. and yeah. they each have their moment to take the stage. And yeah, time to breathe for us to perceive who they are and understand their motives and all that. It's fascinating. I mean, really, we could be for hours. I'll move on though. Um, so the highlight for me of this film in particular is its music. Uh, most of it written by James the Bullet Samuels who's just mm -hmm. like, a genius all of and it. such a character oh yeah. yeah all of it yeah pretty much every moment um so cutting to a very musically um dominating film does that have any um implications for the film editor in particular uh absolutely yeah um i mean it was amazing having james as a as a composer you know he has these two modes he's able to seamlessly switch between director and composer and i guess seamless is the word because right from the first meeting with him he was singing the film to me, you know, yeah. and it was clear yeah. that there was no boundary in his head between dialogue and music and sound design and camera movement. It's all just one big symphony as far as James is concerned. Um, but to have him composing the music, you know, he was composing right during shooting even, and he would send me little demos and bits and pieces and it, it evolved together. So the, the pictures and the music, the drama all kind of, were locked in this beautiful dance, you know, throughout. So, for example, Guns Go Bang, which is like the, the big, beautiful piece with the orchestra and with Jay-Z and Kid Cudi. Originally, all that was, was a beat. He had this beat that he'd made from gunshots, which was amazing. Um, and he said to me, you know, try it out on the end of the Maysville sequence, the White Town sequence. Mm. But it probably won't work because it'll fight with the actual you know, gunshots and whatnot. Um, but as I found, I was able to, to edit the track somewhat and then edit the pictures so that all of those things kind of fell into lockstep together, which we were trying to do throughout, you know, notice yeah. when Rufus Buck rides into the, the tune, wow. The Promised Land, the, thing, the horses just, I, I was able to keep them in rhythm for a few steps at least, and then we cut, we move on. Oh. Um, Oh. But but all of that kind of thing gave the film and the characters the kind of swagger that, that James wanted them to have. The music was part of those characters. Yeah. Um, but it was a beautiful interplay, you know. Moments like uh, when Nat Love rides into town, we have that amazing um, 
don't even know what, how to describe it, flying fox shot, but it yeah, zooms yeah. in all, all the way down the street. James had written something for that, and he'd written something for the next part uh, where Nat rides all the way through town. He'd written this kind of march. But what we were missing was a kind of answering, um, a, an answer from Rufus. And so we had these shots that we, you know, series of shots that kind of jump down the line. Yeah. And I found little bits, because I had the stems of the string session that he'd done, I found little bits and pieces that I could create a musical bridge, a bridge both musically and visually um, that worked with those shots. And I just said, wow. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. So it was it was just this constant um, interplay between yeah. music and the pictures, the story, the dialogue. Nothing was ever. He never said to me, "Okay, here, here it is, and it's locked, and we just have to deal with it." Yeah. You know, there was always a kind of back and forth the music. I'm so not surprised when I spoke to James not long ago, it just, even when he speaks and responds to a question, it's seen, there's a rhythm to it. He sings his answers sometimes. Like he's just, I think that he must have music in his head all the time. He's so fascinating. Yeah. And music and storytelling. He's a, he's a great storyteller. So he really is just even when you're just chatting with him and the movie doesn't feel forced. There is such a rhythm to it. I must also give props to Richard King's sound design. Like yes. just, Unbelievable yes, thank you. work. So you've Incredible. got that. You've got James's music, his direction, the screenplay, the actors, and then you're and then you are also trying to cut to this rhythmic uh, storytelling, so to speak. Um, you've never really done anything like that before. So I mean, were you slightly terrified? Was it just something you relished? Talk us through that. Yeah, I mean, I I did relish it. Um, I think. I mean, I think there's music in everything. I think it is, you know, like these are just arbitrary, in a way, arbitrary barriers that we put up between yeah. different parts of the of the medium to to make it easier for us to think about. Yeah. But um, and, and in editing, there's always, you know, there, there's always rhythm and melody, even I, I, I think, in a way, um, to certain shots and the way that they play out and the way that you combine them. It's yeah. just not necessarily musical in the traditional sense. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't totally terrifying. Uh, and I feel like, you know, for me, often um, music is a really important part of the way that I work. And I'll, um, you know, I'll put a lot of thought and time into the needle drops in a movie like um, Hunt for the Will of People or, or Jojo Rabbit. Um, yeah. And but oftentimes I feel like I'm the person who, who who is the most nerdy about music. But on this movie, I was the I was the bottom of the pile. You know, there's James, Jay Z, um, you know, Clint, our music editor. Yeah. There's Kikari, <laughs> Lauren. No, I could go on, but yeah. but you know, I, I just had to not fuck it up. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think yeah, that's that's the main thing. Most of us are like that. Just don't fuck it up, right? And if you can do right. that, great. And then if you can do something even better, amazing. Um, my final question is this, Tom. Um, when we spoke last time, it was 2020. Um, I, I think you had just been nominated for an Oscar. Uh, and then a few hours later, you won the Ace Eddie Award uh, for JoJo oh, Rabbit. Right. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was a while ago now. I think that was just before the pandemic hit really hard. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that was the year that Parasite won the Oscar. Uh, JoJo Rabbit, Taika Waititi won the screenplay. Um, we only just watched Jojo Rabbit, I think, three weeks ago because my daughter's on this whole Scarlett Johansson thing and so she wanted to watch it. Oh, Shame cool. Thing. But um, we, I watched it again and I just remembered how much I enjoyed that film and your work on it. And I just would love you to tell us what was your highlight from that whole awards journey when you were on that film. Um, I mean, yeah, that was a trip. That was really fun. Uh, I think probably the highlight might have been meeting Thelma Schoonmaker. Um, wow yeah you know editing god goddess yeah um who's cut you know so many of the movies that have, uh -huh. have inspired us um so that was that was pretty incredible uh and and just surreal you know we're sitting on these panels together and she'd be telling these amazing stories and then she'd finish and and they would turn to me and so like, well, I, yeah. I have to follow that <laughs> <laughs> Um, just, I just want to sit. I just want to listen to her talk some more. Um, right. Yeah, that, I mean that was that was pretty wonderful, and um, and I got to know all of those nominees. Um, 
so and we still stay in touch some of us so that was a, a really nice journey and it kind of extended my um, editing network which I'm kind of you know I'm meeting more editors now than I've ever known in my life it's it's a nice yeah. time I can imagine now that especially that you relocated to the states well on that note mate congratulations on some really fantastic work in the heart of a fall I look forward so to much. more of your work and good luck this award season I hope we get to see you on a red carpet perhaps cool thank you so much for having me on mm-hmm.